No. <laughs> We're changing input on Windows. So Windows has a rewritten input stack such that touch is brought right to the forefront of the operating system, but we still do great work with mice and keyboards as you might expect. And we're changing the way that the user interacts with their applications on the operating system by providing a new start screen that they use to interact with those applications. 500 million licenses of Windows 7. 500 million licenses, I think. Uh, and so there's a vast user base out there of Windows 7 and a very strong operating system, and that's where we start from. What we're trying to do with Windows 8 is provide a great experience across all the hardware that it runs on. So today, I think you'll see a few of the guys presenting from these little slate devices. I'll talk about that in a second. It's a Samsung device. Um, obviously, it's a slate form factor. I think at the end of February, we released another preview that we call the Consumer Preview, which is what we're both running here. And we've just recently announced that the first week of June, we will make available another preview, which will be called the Release Preview. That's kind of like a release candidate, really. So this is prototype hardware running um, preview software. I'm here on the lock screen, and I, okay. And even before I log in, I've got a whole bunch of information on there that is, um, some of it is system provided information. So I've got the date and time on here, so clearly date and time from the system. I've got whether I've got power, I've got whether I've got network. But also there's a couple of little pieces of information on here that actually come from an application, so you can see um, I've got my weather for Manchester, which is where I come from. I've got email status at the bottom, telling me I've got 49 emails to read, um, even before I log in. And that can be presented from your application. The user can have your application presenting this information on the screen here. If I want to log in, I can just swipe up from the bottom because it's a touch-based device. And then I've got a number of different ways I can log in. I can log in with a password, I can log in with a PIN, or I can log in with a picture password, which is what we've got here, which works kind of best for touch. So that's why we're using picture password here. So, as I said, these tiles are mine, so, you know, as I'm looking at the screen here, and actually one thing to say about the screen, it might look a bit long. Let's run a few applications. Let's go back and run Photos, and let's go back and run IE, and let's go back and make sure we're running Weather. We've got those things running. And now if I swipe in from the left-hand edge and back, you see there's my little list of applications I can quickly switch to. So if I want to switch to Photos, if I want to switch to IE, if I want to switch to Weather, I can do that. I can also just swipe the, the applications in from the left-hand edge of the screen. So I can just swipe them in, and they just come in, and you can go faster and faster and faster with this. And you might notice that the weather application has laid itself out differently because it's in that view on the left-hand edge of the screen. So actually a different view of that application because it's, because it's put itself there. I should be able to drag other applications. It looks like we've lost one. Let's see if we can get rid of that. Let me see if I can get rid of a few things. We'll have another stab at this. It's a touch-based browser in, in this form, so if I've still got my internet connection, thank you, I have. Um, we can pop out to a website like this one, I can navigate around with touch, swipe in from the left-hand side, and that takes me back. If I want to navigate forward, I can swipe from the right, and that takes me forward. If I want to zoom in and out, I can just tap in, in order to zoom, or I can pinch in order to zoom, and you get the idea as to how that works. Beautifully hardware accelerated font rendering by Direct2D. It looks great. It looks beautiful. If I wanted to share this recipe for, what is it? Sausage and something pies? Actually, I'm not sure I want to share this recipe, but never mind. Um, if I wanted to share this recipe, I could just swipe a bit of text. And in most operating systems, what you'd expect to do is copy and paste that somewhere. We have a, a much sort of enhanced version of, of that idea in Windows 8 that we call sharing. And what that means is if I can go out and bring in the charms bar again, I can go and share from this app. And what the system does is it says, well, IE is sharing probably some text or some HTML. I'm not sure what exactly it's sharing. We walk to other applications on the machine and we say, hey, is there anyone out there who can understand text or HTML? Is there anyone who can consume that content? And in this case, there's just the mail and the dictionary application that can. And so we can say, okay, send that into the mail application. And of course, the mail application knows how to send email, so 
it's now going to set up an experience for me to send email. If we didn't select the text in quite that way, let's just clear that text selection and do the same process. This actually gives IE uh, more of a chance to share something else. And so if again went to the mail application, you'll notice that the content is different. It's taking the title of the article, it's going to build up a little pricey of the article, it builds up some images from the article. So it actually takes more. So the opportunity is there for the application to say what it wants to share and the receiving application to decide what to do with that. This is a very sort of generic contract in the operating system between anyone that wants to share and anyone that can do anything <coughs> useful with the data that is being shared. We have free tooling for building Windows 8 Metro style applications. So pretty much everything you need should be here in the free edition of Visual Studio. We have a, a whole new set of APIs for building Windows 8 Metro style applications. We call it WinRT or Windows Runtime. And these are new native APIs within the operating system. So these are native platform APIs. And they really define the platform for building these kinds of applications. They are the common piece. They are in every Windows 8 Metro style application. You can write JavaScript code. And you can, and if you're building a Windows 8 application, you will really call into those WinRT APIs. They are all projected into JavaScript for you to call with great performance and great fidelity. This is the list of tags that people are currently searching Flickr for. So it's like, what is active on Flickr right now? So I can say, okay, go and get me the tags that match what the user has typed in on the screen. <coughs> this thing here is um, a method that I wrote and it's an asynchronous method. It goes off on the network asynchronously. Query parallel lines, for instance. And we get a nice set of parallel lines. I don't want, that doesn't look like parallel lines to me. But we're getting images brought back quite nicely from Flickr. We didn't do a ton of work to make that happen. We do have our own library in here that you probably will use. It gets referenced by default. It's a bunch of CSS to make the controls look like Metro style controls and it's a bunch of JavaScript. Um, specifically what's in that JavaScript, uh, a couple of things. One is um, some code, some libraries, to make it easier to work with WinRT's asynchronous nature. So WinRT is highly asynchronous, as you might have seen in some of the .NET code. It also is asynchronous in JavaScript and in native code, so we have a library in there. It's an implementation of a, a library called Promises, which you may have seen in other libraries. So just to illustrate for one second, um, the UI that I've got here in, in the HTML world, you'll notice that what I've got here is um, a div. So I've got a title on my screen, as you might expect. I've got a div, and this div is acting as a WinJS control. It's acting as an app bar. And within there is a button, and that is acting as a control. It's acting as a command on that app bar. We've also got a, a list view here. Uh, there isn't a grid view in the JavaScript world. We have a list view control which can do both grids and lists, so you just switch a flag on it. But we've got a div here which is acting as a list view. And you might spot that <coughs> it has an option to use a template on each item, kind of like we did in the XAML world. And that template is just a div up here, which is acting as a template control. And for every item we encounter, every photograph, we display an image and we are data binding the source of that image to a property called image URL on the underlying object. And we display a div and we are data binding its text to a property called title on the underlying object. It kind of looks like the XAML solution in some ways. I've got my CSS properties over there. I can see which styles are contributing which CSS properties to the outgoing the ultimate value. And actually, there's quite a nice thing about this. In the XAML-based world, you are strongly typed, so the design tool can do quite a lot of work on your behalf. In the HTML world, you are not strongly typed, so it's harder for a design tool to try and do work on your behalf. So what we do here in Blend is we have this notion of interactive mode, where you can actually run the app, and I've got a little bit of a, of a trick, I think, in this app, where it goes and does a search just if I click on the title. And we can run the app to a particular position, and then we can come out of that interactive mode and have a look at the live DOM that we're looking at here and pick particular elements within that DOM, find them, and then go and have a look at their styles. So if we go and look at the particular styles, we can see 
in our styles over here, where are those item containers? Oh, there they are. Right, so now I can start to adjust those styles for those particular elements. So the design tool is slightly different if you're working in HTML. The APIs are kind of the same. What kind of uh, next? We should switch to the store. And I land in the store. And you can see it's a categorized store. We've got a spotlighted section for the local <coughs> UK marketplace. Games, entertainment, photos, you know, lots of, lots of different categories as we whiz backwards and forwards. There's some filters on the right-hand side in blue. The store is in preview, and all the applications at the moment that are in there have been kind of invited in there by Microsoft. Because <coughs> so you can't just openly submit an application yet. And also, they're all free. So these categories don't really make sense. You know, top paid for apps doesn't make sense yet. But we can wander into top free. And there's a whole bunch of, of applications there in the store. If I want to find an application, I can go and search for it. So, for instance, if I bring up search, uh, I know and I'm hoping that I can find the WordPress application. So if I want to find WordPress, there's the WordPress application. I can see the details of it. I can have a look at some screenshots for it. All well, looks quite nice. I can look at the details over there. You might spot that some things from the application manifest are starting to show up on this screen, like this application has the permission to use my internet connection. I want to look at reviews of this. Have a look at reviews of it. And then if I want to install it, I can go and, and tap to install. And we'll also surface the store on the internet in the sense that if you go and do a web search and search for WordPress, Windows 8 or something like that, a search engine will land on a web page for this app, and then you can go from that web page to actually install the app. Now, we don't have that live on the web yet, but I can show you a similar experience. If we go to IE, let's just take IE over here, and we're still making that sausage recipe from before. If we go to WordPress.com, they have some metadata on this site that says we have a Windows 8 application. And what that means, and unfortunately it's right at the bottom of the screen, I can tap on this piece of UI and it says, do you want to get the app? And I can jump from there, I think. And obviously it jumps me back to WordPress again in the store. If I want to install the app, I can install it. I can go over to um, the desktop, probably find it installing somewhere down at the end here. It's installed, it sends me a toast notification, I can use that to run the app. I run the app, it, it does what WordPress does. I can play around with that, maybe close it down. And actually, if I go back to IE at this point, I don't know if I have to refresh the page, but if I tap, you can see it knows now I've actually got the app. So I can just jump straight to that app from there, as you can see. It's very useful for the user to be able to try the application up front. And so what we have is a, a couple of different ways of doing trials. You can do a time-based trial. You can let me try your app for a week. Or you can do a feature-based trial. If you're building a game, you can let me try level one and then until I buy the app and then you sell me the other levels. You might sell me your app or you might give me your app. That's your choice. If you then want to sell me something else, so maybe you're a magazine app and you want to sell me the latest issue of the magazine. Maybe you're a video rental app and you want to rent me a movie to watch in the next two days. You can do both of those things through the store. You can sell me something permanently or you can sell me something for a fixed period of time. That's in the store model. And then very importantly, whether you sell me your app or you give me your app, if you want to sell me something else, like a magazine issue, if you run that transaction through our store, you fall into the 70, 30, or 80, 20 percent split for that transaction. If you have some other way of running that transaction, if you already have some kind of commerce engine, so if you're a big newspaper, for instance, you've already got a list of subscribers, and you already have a way of collecting money from them, if you don't put those transactions through our store, you don't pay us anything on those transactions. <coughs> So anything you want to sell that you don't sell through our mechanism, you don't have to pay us anything. So that's, that's you know, 100% in your favor at that point. So think about that one. That's interesting. And similarly, on the advertising side of this, we have an advertising SDK. We have an advertising platform. If you use it, there's a revenue sharing model in there. If you want to use a and other advertising platform, you can use it and you don't pay us anything on that. So a whole bunch of flexibility around the store.